Hi, I'm Veronica Van Wollen, and I'm joined today with five impressive public company executives to discuss the topic of leadership in the capital markets. We all know as investors, it's key to assess the leadership teams behind any company because ultimately you're investing in the people and their ability to execute and drive shareholder value. So in this panel discussion, I want to give you the inside scoop on how these female executives make decisions and lead their teams and shareholders to success. And without further ado, I want to introduce our panel because we have a full house here. I'll call you each by name. And if you can just give the audience a quick summary of who you are, your company, and kind of where you came from and what you're doing today. So I'll start off with Jennifer McCarran. And Jen, take it away, CEO of Thunderbird Entertainment. Thanks for having me, Veronica. And it's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm Jen McCarran. I am CEO of Thunderbird Entertainment. Uh, we are a high quality global content studio. We create, own, and distribute award-winning factual, animated, and scripted content worldwide. I have come up through the arts field. I've grown up in this industry, started out as an office production assistant over 20 years ago, and have sort of, uh, when doors of opportunity have opened, I've, I've walked through them, um, but definitely, uh, perhaps often still more comfortable uh, pitching a show to Disney uh, than talking to banks, but I, I'm getting there, so it's lovely to be here. Mm -hmm. Love it. Thank you for the background. I'll hand it over next to Tara Christie, President and CEO of Banyan Gold. Thanks, Veronica. Real pleasure to be here. So uh, I grew up uh, in the mining business. My dad's a, a structural geologist. So I grew up in the exploration and, and then later placer mining business. Uh, I spent 20 years running a placer mining operation, a small gold mine effectively. Uh, so really learned cap capital discipline and a broad range of, of the whole business. And then, you know, moved into consulting and First Nations relations and, uh, you know, getting that full breadth of experience, which you need to be running a, a junior mining company. And, and then started to get into the public company uh, business, uh, um, sitting on boards and understanding what that meant. And so it's been a long uh, transition, uh, really operationally focused for many years and then becoming, um, you know, a CEO in 2016. And Banyan Gold's a Yukon focused gold exploration company, which is uh, growing very quickly. Awesome. Thanks for the background. Sherry Roberge, I'll hand it over to you next, CFO of Defiant Silver. Tell the viewers just a little bit more about uh, who you are, your background, and your role with Defiance today. Uh, thanks, Veronica. And uh, again, I'm super excited to be here. Um, uh, like uh, Veronica said, my name is Sherry Roberge. I'm the CFO and Corporate Secretary at Defiant Silver. Uh, so Defiant Silver is, a, is an exploration stage company, a mining company. Uh, we're located in Mexico and we have two, two uh, advanced standalone projects, uh, the Santa Casio Silver Project and the Tapal Gold Copper Project. Um, so a little bit about my history. I'm a, a CA, CPA, CA. Um, um, I articled uh, uh, in public companies, so a large, um, large public accounting firm in Vancouver, and uh, primarily in public companies, um, specifically in the resource sector. Uh, and so, you know, my first role outside of that was actually a controllership role for um, a public mining company uh, at the time called Geologics Explorations, and that, that was the Topal mm -hmm. Gold Copper Project. Um, that company was acquired by Defiance Silver in 2018, uh, and I subsequently took on the role of CFO for Defiance and the two, uh, the two projects in Mexico. Great. That's a nice transition. Thanks for the background. Uh, next, I'll hand it over to Liz Williams, who is CFO at Meneseta Therapeutics. Go ahead, Liz. Thanks, Veronica. Liz Williams, I'm the Chief Financial Officer at Medicina Therapeutics. We are a biotechnology company focused in the cancer space, developing drugs for areas where there's really significant unmet medical needs for patients. Like Sherry, I'm a CA CPA by training and I worked at Ernst & Young for a number of years before I decided uh, I wanted to do something a little more entrepreneurial and really kind of jump into a company that I could help grow uh, with. And so I really didn't know what I was getting into with biotech, but it seemed like a good idea. Uh, I was interested because the company I joined was uh, working on a drug for pancreatic cancer, which is a really challenging indication. So I joined um, Aptos Biosciences as the company is currently called. I was previously Loris Therapeutics and I spent 12 years there, which is a very long time to be at one biotech company, but it was a great training ground for me, I started as an assistant controller and um, progressed up 
to be uh, to VP finance. And then in late 2016, I had the opportunity to join Medisana and uh, it was a private company at the time and they were looking for somebody that could uh, help take the company public onto the TSX. So I was excited about the science, the opportunity, or they, we were or are developing a drug for glioblastoma, which is a really challenging form of brain cancer. So I uh, joined in 2016 and we went public onto the venture exchange in 2017 and then onto the main board same year and most recently onto NASDAQ. So happy to be here today. Thank you. For Great. Having Thanks. Me. Thanks so much, Liz. It's been awesome to see the, the progression of the company. Uh, lastly, I want to introduce Alex Woodier Sharon, uh, CEO and founder of Empress Royalty. Alex, please take it away. Thanks so much. Great to be here with these amazing ladies. Um, I, uh, my background is I started off at PricewaterhouseCoopers and then I joined Endeavor Financial as an analyst, um, worked up to becoming director of structured finance in the London office. So very much an investment banking background. Um, started, uh, we started Empress about a year ago. Uh, we started trading in December and it's a precious metals royalty and streaming company. So a young company, um, obviously just listed um, and developing out our company at the moment. So it's, a, it's definitely a fun time for, for all of us. Perfect. Thanks so much for your backgrounds, everyone. Now, I want to jump into it because we definitely have a full house here and a lot of interesting perspectives. And kind of my first question that I want to focus on is, you know, we know that both men and women bring incredible traits that make them effective leaders. And what was interesting to me in my research is that uh, recently women-led venture public companies are showing to outperform their male counterparts. And I'm curious in your opinion, what unique qualities do you feel female leaders bring to the table, especially in the context of a public company? And I think I'm gonna point that question first to Jen. And if you wanna take it away and, and give us some insight on that question. Yeah, I love that question. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, we went public in late 2018 and certainly uh, when the board asked me to step forward um, and take the company public, having been always operational, um, I said, I. It's an honor, uh, but uh, if you want somebody just to focus on the quarters and the bottom line, I'm not your person. I wanna build a business. I wanna build people, develop talent, um, create a culture of excellence. And that remains my passion today. And although it may be a broad generalization, I do think the key to company success is there's no greater asset than the people. And, um, and women will invest, I believe, more strongly in the people. Of course, the financials and the bottom line matter, but when you build a culture of excellence where everyone feels safe, honored, no one feels like a number, the financials will, will fall in line. Yeah, it's so true. And I think it's easy for investors to, you know, you need to weigh that very heavily when you're looking at investment decisions because you can have the same asset in two different management teams and both will not perform equally. So that's a great point you raise. I'm curious, Liz, what's your opinion on that question? I think women are very good at multitasking in a way that men just like <laughs> can't comprehend. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, society still, although it's improved a lot, demands more of women as mothers and other responsibilities in addition to their, their job. So um, yeah, I think the ability to be able to juggle lots of things at the same time, but still giving each thing um, focus and attention is, is an amazing quality in an executive, right? Especially in a small company um, where you have to wear lots of hats and there's lots of balls in the air and being able to keep all of those things moving forward at the same time is, uh, is really very valuable. Yeah, definitely. I know, Tara, you were sharing with me uh, just before that you had a, a significant amount of one-on-one -on -one meetings this week during your conference. So speaking of juggling and multitasking, you definitely seem like an expert in that. Um, curious what you think, what, what kind of unique qualities do you feel female leaders bring to the table with public companies? Great, well, I agree with both what Elizabeth and Jennifer brought up, um, but you know, what you really need uh, as well is that broad background of all aspects of the business so that you can make those critical decisions, um, assess risks, and, and really, you know, because, you know, women have generally a pretty broad um, range of things that they have to do, they, they're naturally um, 
you know, come about having that broad understanding. For, for me, in the mining business, you know, I had to get a broad understanding of every aspect of the mining business so that now I can pull it all together from the, you know, the First Nations relations to the permitting to the environmental uh, and then the corporate governance of a public company. And, you know, that, that also took a lot of perseverance uh, and, you know, I'm pretty driven. That's the other thing of a many, many of the women colleagues that are here, uh, you know, a little bit of type A personalities who, who really go beyond and do their, the personal work uh, and, you know, are naturally curious to be able to do, do the research, learn what it is you don't know, and then bring it all together as a package and, and to know yourself well enough to ask when you need to get support and, and when you can actually be comfortable making the decision, understanding the risk. Uh, you know, I think the worst thing would be for you to have to go to a lawyer for every single decision. Your bills would be ridiculous, but, you know, you need to know when you need to ask. And uh, and that's something that just comes with experience and time and also building a network of, of other women. And that's one thing I'm super passionate about, women leaders. We all need to be super supportive of other women and start to build up other women and be mentors. I completely agree. I think you brought up an excellent point. Knowing yourself really helps you be a stronger leader because then you can understand, you know, um, complications, strategies, et cetera. You can just make much better decisions. And I, I'm curious, just as a quick follow-up question for you, have there been certain things that have helped you, uh, you know, gain better insight of who you are as a leader? Oh, certainly all the challenges, you know, sometimes I, I think that saying if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Uh, but, you know, some of those times when you're faced with uh, things that are really difficult and you're challenged to figure it out, um, certainly have you know made you really think about who you are, what resources you have, how you think through things strategically. Um, and, and that, you know, those times I think really have and some of the tough economic times when it was difficult to finance or, you know, all those things. Uh, really help shape your thoughts and then what you do as you, you know, and I'm leading a larger company and, uh, and the things have to change again. So I need to think differently and be flexible in that. Definitely. No, thanks for the insight. Uh, Alex, I'm curious in your opinion, unique qualities that uh, female leaders add to the table for public companies. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I think um, Liz, Jennifer and Tara, you've covered a lot there in terms of it being uh, women are very strong and multitasking especially in a public company, because you're dealing with not only building your business and the long-term strategy of what you wanna do, but you're tied into uh, the investor awareness, um, shareholders who just look sort of instantly at the share price rather than the long-term strategy and not deviating from that. And then you have the corporate governance side, there's, there's so many aspects to it. Um, so it, it can be challenging in that sense, but I think naturally, I think we're all, uh, the multitasking aspect of what we're able to do and, and, and move through and, and adjust our leadership style in each one of those situations as well. Yeah. Different skills are definitely required for different areas of the business. For sure. And I, I can see, you know, in, in, with leading teams, really important to bring people to the table of a diverse background that just help you think critically and differently. And that's not to say it's men or women. It's, it's just people from interesting backgrounds that share those common values and common goals uh, to achieve a specific, you know, objective for the company. So I know, Sherry, uh, we've talked about a lot here. I'm just curious if there's anything else you want to add on that topic of, you know, unique qualities or traits that, that you feel female executives bring to the table for public companies. Yeah, I really like what uh, you all said there. I agree. Um, and uh, and Veronica, what you, what you said there at the end, like, um, you know, each member of a diverse group of people is going to bring a different um, lens, a different perspective, a different set of skills. And ultimately, it's about, you know, the collaboration of those different skill sets to, um, you know, better decision making. And, you know, as a public company, shareholder interest um, you know, is our priority and our, and our duty as a public company. And so, you know, making those, um, you know, making the best decisions possible using the diverse set of, you know, skills and perspectives is what's going to result in the, the best decision making, the best strategy, corporate governance, and ultimately, you know, drive the company for success. I couldn't, you've said it perfectly, I couldn't agree more. Um, I want to kind of pivot to my next question here, which talks about leadership style. And I'm, I'm not sure if you are all familiar with uh, Simon Sinek, but he's written some great books on leadership and has some great content on the topic. And I really like how he pointed out that uh, to be a good leader, it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, charismatic or the quote unquote extroverted leader. I know I'm, I'm not that kind of personality. So I'm curious in, in your experience, how would you describe your leadership style and how has that evolved over time? And I might actually flip that back to, to Sherry to answer that question. 
Yeah, thanks, Veronica. Um, you know, I, I think well, in my experience, um, different leadership styles um, are, are learned, you know, through experience over time. And ultimately, I believe that leadership is a fluid practice. Um, and truly effective leaders can take the different styles um, and apply them, you know, to the position at hand and to the, to the teams at hand. Um, you know, for, for Defiance, we have extremely high performing and autonomous teams, um, and that requires a different strategy, a different leadership style than, um, you know, a team that's not so autonomous. And ultimately, um, I think for us, inclusive, um, and collaborative communication is the key kind of to tie all those teams together, um, to bring our perspectives together, our diverse perspectives together to make the best decisions possible for the company. Yeah. And I know when, when you and I had spoken uh, offline, you mentioned that a skill set that you bring to the table is that collaborative open communication. And I know that uh, you're really good at that, especially because your team is you know, located in North America and Mexico, kind of all over being a mining company. So it's really important to kind of foster that collaborative effort. Absolutely. Um, like you said, our, our board is, is all over the world. Our, our, our operations are in Mexico. Um, our, 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 you know, technical and geological teams are in Mexico. Um, and uh, it is about all about for us, um, open com and collaborative communication, because that's the only way for us to effectively make, um, you know, decisions. Yeah. Liz, I'm curious with uh, your leadership style, because you have an interesting background from biotech and you're, you're also the other CFO on our panel here today. How would you describe your leadership style and, and how has that evolved over your time with um, multiple biotech companies? Um, it's, yeah, like Sherry said, it's definitely an evolution. Um, I, I try to be a collaborative leader. Um, I've learned I think, I don't know if it's the accounting background, but a certain <clears throat> desire to control details to make sure that everything is done <laughs> properly. Um, but that's a very ineffective leadership style I've learned. And it also holds you back as a leader because if you need to control all of the pieces, then you can't let go and focus on the more, um, it, you know, the, the more strategic element. So that's something I've, I've definitely been working on throughout my career to um, trust the people that I'm working with that are competent and capable and letting them kind of run with a process uh, that I can check in on, but I don't need to, to control. So um, I like to try to empower people to make their own decisions, do their own research, um, and, and to be there to advise as needed, but not to control the process. Yeah, I can appreciate how that must be difficult. And you, like, like you said, you need to empower your team members to make those decisions and think for themselves, right? Because I think a good mentor of mine once said, as you move up leadership and, and build larger teams, you're going to have to be making more difficult decisions with less information. And if you don't surround yourself with a team that can think for themselves and be autonomous, you, you physically cannot control every moving part in a, in a big machine. So great, yeah. great perspective. Um, Alex, what do you have to share on that topic? How has your leadership style changed? Because I know you've recently entered kind of the public markets mm -hmm. coming from a more of a banking uh, background. So how has that changed for you over time? Um, you know, definitely evolved. I think we always do, always do and always will continue to do. I think that's important. Um, I embrace the situational leadership style. I definitely don't see myself as autocratic or laissez-faire. Um, definitely more uh, visionary and a pace setter, um, but also, you know, there for the team in terms of coaching style and, and empowering my different departments to take accountability um, and to move things forward. Um, you know, besides the public company side or actual business is a lot of negotiations with companies. So that's much more of a democratic style, uh, working with my teams and, and having those good relationships, um, not only with the team, but with the mining company partners that I'm working with. So it's, it's very much focused on a collaborative effort um, and, and driving hard. I mean, we're, we're a young company growing and I'm lucky to be surrounded by people that are very much uh, part of that. Um, this isn't an I corporation. It's very much a we, we situation. And I think I'm seeing that um, the last six months with what my team's been able to do and where we've grown the company um, yeah. to where we are now. I think it's really impressive how uh, you know you're always working on deals uh, across the world and you're super exceptional at building relationships. And I don't know if that's a, a leadership style, relationship building. 
but I would definitely say that defines you incredibly well, as, as well as the other things that you mentioned. Uh, I know we've covered a lot, but I do want to give Jen an opportunity to add some stuff as well as Tara. So Jen, why don't you kind of add anything else to that? How would you describe your leadership style? How has that developed over time as well for you? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, you know, you really know that you've sort of emerged as a leader uh, when you're more invested in the success of everyone else than yourself. I think that defines leadership. And I've always tried to just keep it to three basic principles with everyone um, that I lead in the company. Do they have the tools to do their job? Do they know what they're supposed to be doing? And most importantly, do their managers, myself included, have their backs? Um, because then, you know, mistakes can occur. They always will. And uh, people that jump up and down and point fingers and have tantrums, that's you know, not going to gain any momentum. So that's fine. Just allow the mistakes to occur. You're on their team, have their back, solve it. But let that happen because that's how people grow as leaders and yeah. you can't do everything. So you need that, you know, the this better everyone is around you, the better the company will be. Completely. How, how do you ensure you're picking the right people for, for the job? I really go off soft skills. So even from different industries, are they humble? Do they have a, a passion? Are they enthusiastic? Um, do they have, you know, are they doers? Can they, they handle things and not just pass them along. Um, though those soft skills, I think, you know, anyone can learn, I believe, some of the finer points, but finding those soft skills is very hard to, to do. So if all of those things are in place, that then you've got a rock star and anything is possible, especially the humility, because then you know they're going to do well on teams. It's a really good point. It's sometimes difficult to, to measure for that, especially when you're, you don't have that report with an individual. So I, I know that's a completely different conversation, but uh, I appreciate that insight because it's very, very true. Um, Tara, your leadership style, how would you define that? And, and how has that evolved over time as you're building Banyan Gold? Well, you know, very similar to what some of our other panelists have said, I've definitely had to evolve and change. And uh, particularly right now, we're in a really um, significant growth phase, hiring more people, uh, delegating more responsibility. So, you know, the, the style of, of, of being able to give people responsibilities, recognizing people's strengths and, and helping them, giving them <clears throat> tasks in that, particularly as they first join the team, um, you know, that fits with where they're, they're really most suited. And then, you know, trying to be strategic, making sure people understand what our vision is, what the priorities are, um, especially for new people. And then, you know, being there enough as a coach, uh, but then also backing off after you've de delegated so that people have some time. And yes, they're going to do things a little bit differently. And some of those new ideas are going to be good. Some of them you're going to kind of go, hmm, well, maybe let's try and let's look at this. Um, but you do, you're, you're going to have a few bumps along the way. Um, we just started our winter drilling program, so uh, which in the Yukon, you know, not very many other stories are, are, are people are drilling at this temperature and time of year. So that yeah. has unique challenges and some people really understand it and know what to do and other people are a little bit nervous. So, um, you know, just as an example, that means that some people have to spend extra time making sure that they understand things and other people are like, yeah, let's just get at it. Um, so, you know, every, every situation a company has its own challenges. And, and I know you asked how you pick people. And in this business, I think you find you work with a lot of the same people. So some of the people I hire are people that have worked with me before at other companies or in other iterations. And then you already know their skill sets and how they might fit in your team. And that's a bit of an advantage in our business. It's quite small. And, uh, and you can often get the people who want to come back and work with you again. Yeah, completely. And, you know, with mining companies, there's ebbs and flows of periods of a lot of activity, periods of less activity. So if I'm understanding correctly, it seems like your leadership style might even change over the course of a year just to kind of adapt to what's happening within the company at that time, whether there's more drilling or um, you know, more strategic developments, et cetera. Is that, is that fair to say? Oh, uh, absolutely. And, and that comes along with this job as CEO uh, in a seasonal company. It definitely changes um, depending on the time of year and, and what we have, have going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's amazing the number of different things you think about in the same day that are completely unrelated. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, I want to shift a little bit. And for any investors that are tuning into our, our content here in our panel discussion, 
what do you think investors should really pay attention to when it comes to management teams and leadership styles? Like ultimately, you know, they're, they're investing in you as a leaders and as a team. So what are some things that they should be looking for or questioning management teams when they're looking at their investment uh, decision? And I'm just going to kind of throw that out there. If anyone wants to take the first stab at it, go right ahead. I think, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, I'll jump in. Uh, sure. Certainly, I, I really find the best rapport with investors that get to know the management team. What Just what we've been talking about, what's your leadership style? What type of culture do you set? Um, you know, that really says a lot. And then I think uh, just understanding the vision um, that it's not short term really, um, I think, is key. And, and then watching how things evolve. You know, do they do what they say they're going to do? Are they dependable? I, I, I believe those things are key for every investor. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, just going to say, I think experience is, is important. Um, and not that the entire team has the same experience, but um, when you, like, uh, you know, at Medicina, our CEO has previously exited successfully from a company that he took from early stage to late stage. So that gives investors a lot of comfort to know that, the you know, teams are being led by someone who, has experience um, and has been successful and will do what it takes for another success story. Alex, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I think you absolutely nailed it there, Liz. It's, it's, it's having a team that has the experience, that has the ability to take the vision and the strategy and execute on that. Um, and that's got the proven track record. Yeah. Go ahead, Tara. I would just add to that, you know, whenever I'm looking at something, I look at how much management has in terms of investment and, you know, investment alongside their shareholders, not early founder stock. That that matters to me you know, to know that there's skin in the game uh, from the management. They're willing to put their money where, where their vision is. What kind of percentage of ownership do you believe management teams should have for them to really have stake in the game? Well, I'm a 5% shareholder in Banyan. Um, and our, our management team has about 12% in total. Um, you know, a lot of companies I invest in have more than that. We, we have a pretty small board and, and management team in this particular company. So, um, you know, and I've, I've made significant investments just in this last year uh, in the company, uh, you know, just to demonstrate my confidence in, in where we're going. Yeah, it's, it's always very reassuring to see management buying even on the open market at prices where investors might be uh, accessing the same opportunity. So I want to position the next question to Sherry. And the question I want to kind of dive into here is how are you doing things differently as an executive and what kind of results are you seeing because of that? And, and if you can actually be specific, like what is Defiance doing uh, and what are you doing as a leader that's maybe different that other people you know of aren't doing? Uh, yeah, thanks, Veronica. So, um, you know, what we really do, and, and it's not just myself, it's uh, myself and the CEO and the, um, you know, the technical, the techn technical executives, we really look for, you know, the right people with the right set of skills for the job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and as part of that, we have been fortunate to retain um, intelligent, skilled, uh, professional women as a part of our senior technical and management teams. Um, you know, they're key members of those teams. Our, our senior principal geologist is a, is a, you know, a super brain um, and she's out there in the field. And uh, I just wanted to really highlight on uh, the women uh, at Defiance and, um, you know, the diversity that that brings to, to, to management and, and the company as a whole. And really, you know, secondly to that, we work to empower those people, give them the um, autonomy and control that they need to, to do their jobs and lead their own teams. Um, and I think what we're seeing as a part of that um, is our company's projects really move forward in a fundamental way, specifically our Santa Casio project, um, our Santa Casio Silver project in Zacatecas, Mexico. Um, you know, they've done significant amount of um, surface geochemistry, soil sampling, mapping, uh, targeting, modeling, and, and now we're drilling and we're really seeing that project move forward um, fundamentally, right, from in the right ways. Um, so I think, you know, those things lead to success, the success of the projects, the success of the company and shareholder value. So important. Those are all, you know, all elements that every public company, it should be ingrained within them. Um, Alex. Are you guys doing anything differently at Empress? I know you're a newly listed public company. What's the secret sauce behind a great management team for Empress? 
Um, you know, I think I sort of touched on it earlier. For me, it's very much about the we, not the I. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with some amazing individuals who all, you know, we're all fully invested in the company. Um, you know, we, we collaboratively work on the projects. We have fantastic teams that come together, whether it's our marketing side, whether it's our actual business development side, there's no egos in the room. Uh, I'm working with very intelligent people with a really good track record, uh, proven success. Um, you know, it's very stimulating. It's, it's very exciting with what we're working on. And we have a hell of a lot of fun too. Um, you know, lucky we're working with some really fun people. Yeah. Jen, I'm sure for you, it's bringing dogs to the office. <laughs> we do have a pet policy. A I love it. I can see him poking through there. He should yeah, drop the camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I completely agree with everything Alex and Sherry have said. I think, you know, for us, we keep uh, diversity and inclusivity as a hallmark of our um, company. Uh, not only is it the right thing to be doing, it's also it, it proven to be very good for business. As content providers, we have an obligation to create content where I believe every man, woman, child, um, of any race, gender, you know, ethnicity, you know, else reflected back in a positive light. Uh, and our company demographic reflects that we're 45% male, 45% female, and 10% gender fluid. And we're constantly working to elevate new voices, new uh, in, into authentic, you know, storytelling roles, uh, supports, mentorship um, to bring up the next team of leaders. Love it. I remember Sherry, when we were speaking offline, you mentioned how weekly your team just has an hour, just fluid conversation, just to talk about kind of what's on everyone's mind and, and give people that collaborative and um, I guess creative opportunity to speak, which I found really, really interesting. I'm curious with Liz in, in your team at Medicena, you know, biotech, a lot of scientists, very data-driven minds. Are you guys doing anything <laughs> different to kind of help the leadership and, and with management? Yeah, I think, um, you know, our industry is kind of unique where most of the people that work in there, it, it's a passion, right? It's like you're, you're part of trying to do something to help people in general. So um, I think everyone in on our team is very driven by that greater um, perspective or greater goal of trying to help patients that have a need and you know they don't have access to a drug. So we, um, because of that, we're very uh, you know all hands on deck, and um, we work together very well. We have to pivot very quickly all the time. Um, we have to value very intelligent people um, in very different areas. So you know I'm not a scientist. I'm a finance person, but we all think differently. But we all have to work together. Mm -hmm. um, for this common goal. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exciting. You feel rewarded when, when you hear positive feedback from patients, et cetera. Um, but we've been, because we have a really strong drive towards an end goal, I think that that's been very beneficial for our shareholders and we've been able to grow the company quite significantly over the last couple of years. Um, and at the same time, you know, have a clinical trial where patients are living two times longer than they would otherwise have been without the drug. So um, that's pretty exciting. And, and to be even a very small part of that is, is very rewarding. It's and very we do have impressive. two thirds women sea level uh, and a third on the board as well, which is, which is fantastic and very diverse group uh, that great. works together. And I know you recently joined a board position as well. Was that with us? Did. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually another biotech company. Um, yeah. In, in the oncology, the cancer field as well. So it's uh, that that's been a really amazing experience to, to see things from that perspective and um, get to work with some really strong experienced people uh, yeah. on the board is, is fantastic. So yeah, that company is uh an up and comer, <laughs> one to keep watch on, Triumvira immunology. Okay. Little yeah. plug there for investors. Yeah. Take a no, look at all of them. And there's another one. <laughs> I don't know if Tara can hear us. I want our audience to get some advice. So if you could rewind the clock, let's say 15, 20 years back, and you were writing a letter to yourself, what advice would you have loved to have been given at that time to your future self? Well, other than by Amazon, and uh, if we could predict this, maybe Zoom. Um, which would probably be my first advice to myself. 
but the other one, you know, and it's the same advice that I, I give to young people, men and women who start out in, in this business. You need as much field and operational experience as you can get. See lots of projects, uh, talk to lots of people, and then, you know, learn about other aspects than just what you're doing, because that's really how you move into different areas is, is just be curious and do lots of, of different aspects in the business and ask, um, you know, speak up if you want to do something different. Uh, and, and, you know, that's part of uh, really becoming part of the management team uh, and growing, advancing is showing that you have ambition and, and you want to do more. Um, so, you know, that would be my first piece of advice or my second after buy Amazon. <laughs> you know, I wish we all need to do that, right? Actually, one of my, uh, my fund manager friends gave me great advice and he said, nothing happens behind your desk. You got to go out there. You got to get your hands dirty. Um, at times, they would even just go downtown and walk the streets to run into people, which I thought was was really unique and fun, just to have conversations spontaneously. I want to um, give Jen the opportunity to answer that question. So, if you could rewind the clock 10, 20 years or so, what would you have loved to have known at that time? I think um, you know, really understand your value system, what what your values are, and um, stay true to that, and surround yourself with people that echo that value system and uh, don't try and please everyone you know as long as it's uh, in line with mm -hmm. women I mean myself I definitely am I, I again this might be a broad generalization but pleasers by nature and that that can be wonderful um, but using your value system your conviction what's important to you as your your north star uh, then then the need to please will go away does this line up with my value system yes great no moving on um, and I, it took me a real long time to figure that out I'm still working on it I think it's never ending. And I love how you said that because I just recently finished reading a book that said, you know, don't look at goals from what you want to achieve. Look at goals from do they align with your values and create value driven goals, which I thought was a really unique way to look at it. Um, Alex, what advice would you be given besides, you know, investing in all these multi trillion dollar market cap companies, which I'm sure we'd all have loved to have done? <laughs> Your old self, I think it would be to be confident, um, to be comfortable being my authentic self, um, to stop and enjoy the experience as it's happening, um, even if it's not a comfortable experience. Um, those are the things that make you grow um, into a great leader and into a great business person, um, to really embrace growth, um, to seek out like-minded mentors. Um, but yeah, for me, I think sort of when I was in my 20s, early 20s, and, and sort of similar friends and stuff, is just to be confident, to be able to be comfortable expressing yourself. Yeah, and I think that comes with time, right? With experience, you build confidence as you get to know your values, yourself, and and where you really fit into the world. So, Sherry, how about yourself? What would you have loved to have known 10, 20 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. I love um, everything that you guys have uh, contributed here, and um, you know the things that I would say to myself 20 years ago are, are some of the things I'm still telling myself today. Uh, trust your instincts. Quiet your ego and lead with humility. And, uh, you know, those three things really resonate uh, with me today. And um, I think, uh, yeah, are beneficial as I move forward in a leadership role. I love that. I love that. It's never ending, right? You always can improve on those three areas. Liz, mm -hmm. how about for yourself? Yeah, I think uh, echoing a lot of what's already been said, but, uh, you know, trusting yourself and your own worth. Um, imposter syndrome is real and definitely something that I think women struggle with and I definitely struggle, continue to struggle with. Um, so just, you know, being sure of who you are and what value you bring. Um, and then also that success is not... Um, necessarily the path you think it will be and it may zigzag back and forth and that's okay it's all part of the experience um as as long as you're learning then go with it and enjoy the ride as as alex said it's like a stock chart it's always going up but not always in a perfect linear line right? but eventually over time it does and yeah. i think we're going to end it at that i just want to say thank you so much for everyone for joining us here today it's really been a pleasure to kind of get to know your minds and how you guys think and how you deliver shareholder value. And I'd encourage any investors or any interested investors to take a look at these five companies, uh, speak with a woman, leave some comments below, and please do reach out. This could be a great opportunity to get exposure to, to biotech, entertainment, and some mining opportunities. So thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us today.